Hello and welcome. Um, glad to have everybody here for the, the Sight and Sound Bites webinar series brought to you by the Ioneer Foundation. Um, we're going to go ahead right ahead and get started because it's already noon. So um, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, this webinar series from, uh, is called uh, Sight and Sound Bites, as I said, from the Ioneer Foundation. We bring this to you every other week and we highlight the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in our two outstanding departments here in ophthalmology and otolaryngology. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation, and um, we're, we're very proud to bring to you today today's program, which I think many of you will find interesting and many of you have signed up for. We have over 100 people who have um, registered for today's program. A little housekeeping. Uh, chat is going to be disabled for you today, so uh, you won't be able to chat to your friends, but um, the question and answer function is available. We really want your questions. So feel free to submit a question at any time. I will be reading the questions to our uh, guest speakers today as, um, as after the uh, presentation is over. Um, we ask you to refrain from any personal health questions um, that aren't going to be as interesting for everybody in the audience to appreciate, but we, we encourage you to submit those and send them an email to Mr. Craig Smith, who would be in your um, email that you receive with this uh, webinar invitation. And you can, um, we, we will get the, your questions answered at any time that you, uh, that, that you uh, submit those to us. Uh, please feel free to, to use the show tub subtitle function for closed captioning for those who need it. And then um, we will let you, uh, we will add you to our email list for future webinars um, unless you, um, uh, ask us to take you off for any reason. So um, I'm very proud to present uh, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel to introduce today's speakers. Our topic for today is cortical vision. Can we see with just our brain? And um, um, I know from the many years working with this department that we really do see with our brain. So this would be an interesting topic for sure. Dr. Sahel is a distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, an exceptional, exceptional class professor at the Sorbonne University in Paris, and he's the Eye and Ear Foundation Endowed Chair. Dr. Sahel, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Loni, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, very exciting uh, webinar. So uh, the topic of today uh, is a bit odd because we all believe we can see only for our eyes, but it turns out that uh, the place where we see is actually the brain and the eye is the entry of that and where things start to be processed until they reach the brain. So why would we try to see without the eyes? It's because there are many conditions where the optic nerve is damaged or there is a damage along the pathway or to the eye directly. And a lot of the strategies that we try to develop uh, and also the current treatments are really working only when you have a functional optic nerve and a good connection between the eye and the brain. So for this reason, uh, on top of all the, the therapies we are trying to develop uh, that are quite promising, like gene therapy, optogenetics, stem cell approaches, or, or retinal prosthesis, we have also been working for the past uh, several years alongside with many of the scientists across the world on the idea of trying to stimulate directly the brain. But this requires a very significant amount of work, not only technological, but a lot of neuroscience, trying to understand how the brain is processing the information, how this type of vision restoration could occur, how the brain would be able to interpret the images that could be given back, and there are many other very important questions that are both technological, but more importantly, very scientific and very clinically related, which means that this is really a question that requires a lot of involvement also, not only from clinician scientists, but also from the patient and the rehabilitation teams. So we are very fortunate because at the School of Medicine in Pittsburgh and the Vision Institute, we have been able to gather not only a team of people involved in uh, innovative therapies on the eye, but also rehabilitation experts. And you heard already some of them presenting upon previous webinars, but a team that is dedicated to cortical vision. So this was uh, sponsored uh, initially and uh, through a very important donation from the Richard King Mellon Foundation and the support of the School of Medicine at UPMC. 
Uh, among the people we have recruited, you already met some of them, Patrick Mayo, Jim Herman, but also already you are going to meet uh, Zing Chen, whom we recruited from the Netherlands Royal Academy of, uh, of Medicine and uh, of Science, actually the Neuroscience Institute in Amsterdam, where she developed over the past many years uh, a very promising approach to stimulate the brain directly that uh, made the news a couple of years ago, was published in Science and led to already an initial clinical trial. She is part of this team, and we are very fortunate that uh, last year we were joined in our department, but uh, by a, a world leader in the field of cognitive neuroscience and visual neuroscience, uh, Professor Marlene Berman, who joined us from Carnegie Mellon University and who has been a, a leading figure and is a leading figure in the field of visual neuroscience. So she's going to also describe the uh, cognitive components of that and uh, also how important it is to understand how the brain is functioning to for brain stimulation. So without further ado, I'm not going to delay further the presentation, but this is going to be very exciting and we'll be there for questions. Uh, as you can imagine, this is going to be an evolving thing over the coming years but uh, we are already making a lot of progress. Thank you very much. So handing over to Dr. Berman and to Dr. Xen. I have also to mention that the program that we are going to talk is also supported by the uh, Beckwith Foundation alongside with UPMC and the RKM Foundation. Dr. Xen or Dr. Berman? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sahel, and um, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, my goal today is going to be primarily to explain to you how the input that's received at the eye can be transformed into a meaningful percept. So we open our eyes and somehow we have the sense of the world in front of us writ large with uh, richness and robustness. In fact, that's not quite how it works in terms of the underlying neural mechanism. So when we look out at the world and, for example, see a fly such as this one, it turns out that the brain is computing the color of the fly, the depth of the fly, so its distance, the form that it's a fly, and also its motion. We know a lot about the eye and how the eye receives signals, and we also know quite a lot about the brain. What we don't know so much about is how the signals from the eyes gets transformed, gets computed into the meaningful perception that we all enjoy. So in addition to the computations that are already mentioned, we are easily able not only to recognize this target fly, but we can recognize a fly like this, like this, like this. We can even recognize a fly like this one and even a fly on a bicycle, even though we've never seen such a thing uh, previously. Uh, the question that I will ask today is how this rich visual behavior emerges from the brain. I will tell you about some new and exciting methods to study live humans. Um, and I will specifically use as my model example, not the fly, but how we recognize, for example, somebody like Bill Gates. It turns out that face recognition is a particularly interesting model to study um, the human visual system for a number of reasons, as I will um, illustrate now. We're extremely good at picking out faces, even out of a crowd like this notwithstanding the fact that faces all share complex geometry, they've all got two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. They all convey a lot of information about the age, the gender, the identity, <clears throat> the emotional ex uh, expression, the eye gaze and intention of the individual. And because this is such a, a finely tuned system, it's a useful domain to explore brain behavior, brain behavior relations. So in today's talk, I'm really just going to tell you a few things about face recognition and the brain. First, I'm going to tell you which parts of the brain are involved. Then I'm going to tell you what happens when these regions of the brain are affected and the face recognition system breaks down. I'm also going to then give you a peek under the hood because I'm going to show you data from in the brain about how the brain represents faces. And finally, I'll tell you something about the plasticity, the potential for reorganization in the brain of the face recognition system. All right, so um, much of the work that I do involves looking at the brain of, um, 
awake behaving humans, we have many technologies at our disposal these days. One of them is a, a MRI machine in which an individual can lie on this table with their head in the bore of the magnet. And while they are in the magnet, we can project onto a screen that we place uh, in front of their eyes, images of faces, words, common objects, houses, and body parts. And it turns out that we can identify exactly which regions of the brain are involved in recognizing which particular kinds of stimuli. So in the adult brain, as I'm showing you over here, there are these very particular regions. Let me just orient you. This is the right hemisphere. This is the left hemisphere. I know it's the wrong way around, but that's how it's done in radiological conventions. Um, the eyes are situated over here. This is the back of the head. And what I'm showing you is an image. If I took my head and I took a wire cutter and I cut it off and I flipped my head face down on the table, you'd been looking down on the bottom inferior surface. And I'd like to point out to you that on this inferior surface, we see specific regions in red that are activated when we look at faces. There are also regions on the side of the brain that are also activated. Other regions are activated when we look at houses or places, others for common objects. But my goal today is to talk to you just about these red regions. So this is what I've shown you from the adult. We could ask the question, where does this organization come from? And one possibility is that you're simply born with these kinds of regions already in place in the human brain. Well, that's not actually true because we did the same experiments with adolescents who actually show a profile very similar to that of um, the adults, but also with young children, ages five to eight, these children are already in elementary school. And as you can see, there are not obvious red areas of the brain. Their face recognition is still developing. And it's possible that it has this prolonged developmental trajectory because face recognition is hard for the visual system. So I've shown you that there are many regions that are involved in face recognition. I've told you that it develops across childhood to adulthood. Let me tell you what happens when it breaks down. Well, um, the condition is known as acquired prosopagnosia. And it's acquired because these individuals had the perfect ability to recognize faces like most of us, but then lost the ability, either because they had a kind of infectious disorder, a, um, a car accident that um, damaged this part of the brain, um, or in this case, somebody who had a, um, a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and this part of the brain was deprived of oxygen. And it is this very part of the brain that's involved in face recognition because if you damage this area of the brain, these individuals recognize very few famous faces. I hope that many of you recognize at least some of these faces, but the individuals who have this prosopagnosia, the failure to recognize faces, don't even recognize their family members or even photographs of themselves. And some of you may be aware of the little book or vignette or perhaps even the play, uh, that Oliver Sacks wrote about the man who mistook his wife for a hat. So here is the hat, but instead he puts his wife on his head. This man, in fact, had acquired prosopagnosia. So damage to this particular part of the temporal lobe leads to an impairment in face recognition. It's actually not the only way in which an impairment can be evident. There are some individuals who have what I will refer to as congenital prosopagnosia. So they are born unable to recognize faces and they don't learn to recognize faces even over the course of development. Colloquially, this is referred to as face blindness. These individuals uh, ad, uh, would agree that the impairment is lifelong. They've never known anything different. Importantly, there is no obvious damage to the brain. They have normal intelligence. <clears throat> they are right-handed, and that's useful because there is something specific about the way the brain responds or is organized in right-handers who make up the majority of the population. They have normal vision, and they identify faces by non-face cues, for example, by someone's voice 
or by perhaps the kind of clothing that they wear. Even one of the individuals whom we all know and love, Jane Goodall, the foremost primatologist today, uh, uh, in her autobiography writes that she has face blindness. And here is an excerpt. She says, she suffers from an embarrassing, um, humbling condition called prosopagnosia, which means she has a problem in face recognition. She thought she was mentally lazy. She tried hard to memorize faces. Then she discovered that her own sister also had this problem. And she wrote to Oliver Sacks, who told her that congenital prosopagnosia is in fact um, a well-known disorder. Um, this type of genetic, um, this type of congenital disorder appears to be genetic. Uh, these are family trees. Each of these colored in um, symbols indicates an individual in this family with this particular kind of disorder. There's some work again on trying to understand um, the genetics of it. And it appears that this is not so uncommon and is present in about 2% of the population. These individuals with CP, congenital prosopagnosia, also don't recognize faces very well. So our expectation is that if we know that this particular area of the brain, this red spot that I showed you previously, and here shown on a number of different individuals. Each of these is a single individual. We show them little movies of faces, buildings, scenes, objects, and I'm only showing you here the face activation region. The expectation is that we would not see this region in the congenital prosopagnosics because they can't recognize faces. Well, it turns out they absolutely have the same apparent face regions as do the normal controls. So this left us with a dilemma. They can't recognize faces, and yet the brain circuit appears to be normal. So we needed to seek an alternative explanation. And one of the ways in which we um, did it was to take advantage of a new method that was available to us, which allows us to map out the wires that connect different areas of the brain. So think about an electrical circuit where you have to propagate signal from one area to another. We, we now have technology that allows us to put a human into one of these magnets that I showed you, MRI machines, and we can plot out and map out the very wiring of their brain. This is from post-mortem, which is the only way we were able to see the wiring um, up until about a decade ago. And now I'm going to show you data using this new methodology. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this fiber tract because it goes from the through this region that we're particularly interested in, which is the face area. All right, so here is the wiring diagram from two individuals. They are aged 42 and 73. These are the two major tracts the two major fiber tracts, white matter uh, projections that go through these, the face circuit uh, that I just demonstrated earlier. And here is the equivalent from the con two congenital prosopagnosics matched to each of these controls. And you can see that the what these lines are much more sparse in the congenital prosopagnosics than in the controls. In fact, here is a slew of different control individuals, different genders and different ages. And if we look at the equivalent maps from the congenital prosopagnosics, we see really sparse fibers, perhaps even the inability to uncover these fibers in some of these individuals. Moreover, the extent to which the tract is reduced is correlated with how bad their face recognition impairment is. So the poorer the tracts, the more impaired in face recognition. So we are now beginning to understand not just regions of the brain that are uh, engaged in face recognition, but also the connectivity between those regions and the way in which signals are sent from one face recognition region to another. So I've told you about congenital prosopagnosia and the compromised tracts. What I'd like to do now is understand 
when we look at the circuit for face recognition, what is going on in that circuit? Like, how does the brain even tell the difference between my face and Dr. Chen's face? How is it coded? Like, is there a language? Is there an alphabet of faces? So I'm going to tell you just a little about how we can begin to explore the code, the neural language that is used to represent different faces. So here are four different faces. We've stripped away the hair. We don't want uh, viewers to have any um, signals, like somebody's got a mustache or somebody's got a particular kind of hairstyle. We really are focusing just on the recognition of the face itself. So we are going to show um, human participants in the magnet uh, faces like this. So these faces with a neutral expression or with a smiling expression. Down each of these columns is the same face. And we're going to look at which regions of the brain, of the many red regions that I showed you earlier, including this one, the major um, focus that uh, I showed you in the red regions. And we're going to look inside this region with a kind of a microscope to see how this region represents these two individuals as being different, but these two individuals as being the same person, even though they've got different expressions on their face. The technique we're going to use is something like a dictionary. We know that the face gives rise to a particular kind of brain signal. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the brain signal and I'm going to see if I can kind of reverse it and bring back the stimulus that gave rise to this brain signal in the first place. The best way I can think about it is if you have a dictionary that goes from French to English and you can look up the corresponding English when you have a French word. You can also take the French, of course, and then look up its corresponding English. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the brain signal that we obtained from showing people these particular faces. And I'm going to see whether I can regenerate the original face that drove that signal. So I'm going to reconstruct the face from the face signal. So this top row are the four faces that I showed you in a neutral expression and with their emotional expression. And what I'd like to point out just as an example is this is the reconstruction down here from the brain signal of this face. And this is the reconstruction from this face. So the first thing is we were amazed that we could reconstruct anything at all. We could have just obtained total junk from this. That we obtained something that looks like faces was remarkable. The second thing we were excited about is that we didn't just reproduce the same face over and over again. Um, we can see that we clearly can uh, regenerate different instances. And in fact, when we asked human participants, how closely did this face match this face? They said about 88% on average or 93% for this correspondence, suggesting to us that we actually have some accuracy in our reconstruction signal. This then led us, of course, to understand, well, what happens in the brain of somebody with congenital prosopagnosia? Why can't they recognize faces? So these are the stimuli I showed you. These are some of the reconstructions from the control participants that I showed you. And this is the reconstruction from the congenital prosopagnosic. And what's important here is that in this individual, her representation of these two faces is essentially the same. We only can reconstruct a very generic low accuracy face. Okay, so I've told you what information is coded. We know that there is some kind of language that's being used in the brain, and we can even decode the faces from that. In the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you about what, what the potential is for plasticity, for reorganization, for recovery, of the face recognition system. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I'm really just going to point out to you two new lines of work that I'm involved in. One of them uh, concerns the study of children who've had uh, an, almost an entire 
hemisphere of their brain removed. These are children. This surgery is called a hemispherectomy, removing a hemisphere. These children have this uh, dramatic surgery because they are having up to 30 or 40 epileptic seizures a day and are unable um, to really develop or learn. Uh, many alternative methods and uh, management uh, techniques have been tried. None of them is successful. And so the best thing to do is to take these children to surgery. And the question that uh, here is a whole display of lots of these children. What I want you to know is how well these children can recognize faces. And I'm also going to show you how well they recognize words. So in these are control uh, subjects who are matched to the patients. And we can see that their ability to recognize faces, generic faces, is about 94% uh, correct. Here are children who only have a left hemisphere and children who only have a right hemisphere. And even though they're missing 50% of their brain, their accuracy is about 85%. It's poorer than the controls, but it's pretty dramatic if you've only got a single hemisphere. And this is true for faces. And the same is actually true for words. Again, with about an 85% accuracy compared to the um, uh, somewhat superior performance of the controls. These data suggest that there is significant plasticity. Uh, if a single hemisphere seems to have about 80% capacity, and that is very exciting. My interest in studying these patients was because I think of them as kind of allowing us to understand the upper bounds of plasticity, a single hemisphere and its competence. Okay, the very last thing I'm going to show you is more recently, we've also been able to use a dramatic new um, approach to understand what goes on in the face recognition system. And this approach, again, is a, um, a clinical methodology, just like the hemispherectomy was. These are also children who are going to go for epilepsy surgery. The surgeons want to know exactly where in the brain the epilepsy is starting. And can they perhaps just cut out that little region rather than having to take out the whole hemisphere? And to explore where the focus of the epilepsy is, they implant these electrodes. So this is going, I hope you can see this is a, a young child. Um, the, the chin is up here, the back of the head is at the, the top of the head really is over here. And these electrodes are inserted through tiny, tiny windows into the skull. And we can then look at these electrodes as they penetrate the brain of this child. Again, this is not um, a, a scientific based approach. It's not because I want to record from their brain. This is because this is part of their clinical evaluation. But while the children are in hospital and they stay there for an extended period of time, while the surgeons and neurologists are monitoring uh, their epilepsy, these participants are willing to do experiments for us, like look at pictures of faces and objects, et cetera. And then we can record from each of these individual little contacts inside of their brain. So we've recorded about 585 um, of these electrodes in the brain. And it allows us to do things like look at their activity for faces, places, words, scrambled and objects. And here is just a single summary um, slide to show you um, uh, compared to when there is nothing present on the screen, what is the neural response when there's faces, objects, places, scrambled and words. And in all of these cases, we can detect very fine and robust neural responses of these electrodes in response to um, the stimuli, to, to showing them these stimuli. So we're very excited about this methodology. It allows us the, pretty much for the first time ever to go inside the human brain and record directly from it. And we are hoping that technologies like this will not only um, be immensely useful for the clinical management of epilepsy, but might also be translatable into thinking about ways in which we can intervene um, in individuals 
um, with blindness and um, using uh, cortical um, implants like the ones that uh, Dr. Chen is going to talk about in a moment. So I've told you that there are lots of regions involved in face recognition. They develop slowly over time. They can break down both because somebody has a stroke or um, has a motor vehicle accident or a heart attack, um, but they can also be in the congenital form where their tracts and uh, circuit itself is compromised. We are now able to look inside uh, these regions of the brain and understand what kind of code it uses. Um, and last, um, we can begin to explore plasticity both in uh, the children who have had parts of the brain removed, but also in those children in whom um, electrodes are implanted for the monitoring of the seizures that also provides us with um, scientific data. So I will stop there and um, thank you all very much. Dr. Berman, thank you so very much. We're gonna now have Dr. Chen. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm very excited to present the work which was done um, in my previous institute. I'm just starting up at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, if you go, if you could go to the next slide, please, Dr. Sahel. So I will give you an overview of blindness, and um, I will also be talking. Sorry, if you could just advance the uh, <laughs> the PowerPoint. I'll also be talking about the visual system and how you can interface with it in order to stimulate the cortex and allow people to see artificially generated percepts. I'll, over, I'll go over some of the work that we've carried out preclinically in animals and give you an overview of the clinical work we've been doing in blind patients and the types of development we've been doing with the system. Next, please. So blindness affects um, approximately 40 million people throughout the world. And this um, is likely to increase to more than 100 million by 2050 due to the aging population. And it severely affects navigation and unfamiliar environments, um, as well as social interaction and reading, leading to easily about 12 billion economic losses um, in the US alone. Most of visual impairment occurs due to degeneration in the retina or the eye and leading causes in developed countries that age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. Next, please. And um, quite a significant proportion also occurs due to ret um, optic neuropathy when the optic nerve degenerates, and a very tiny fraction occurs due to impairments in the brain, namely in the visual cortex itself. However, the vast proportion of blind people still have an intact primary visual cortex meaning that your brain is functional. It's just that signals are not coming in through the optic nerve or through the eye. And so if you think about the definitions of blindness, um, you can think of them in terms of how much of the visual field you still have intact or how sharply you can see. So if you're normally sighted, you can see a large panorama and it's very sharp. If you are um, suffering from retinitis pigmentosa in the beginning stages, you lose peripheral vision. And with um, early stages of AMD, you start losing vision at the center. And um, as the disease progresses um, in each of these cases, you start having a very small visual field and very low visual acuity. Next, please. And so blindness occurs in many different forms and different people adopt different coping strategies um, and have different levels of familiarity with um, technology. So there's no one solution for um, curing all types of blindness. We need a diversity of solutions. Next, please. So how exactly can we interface with the visual system to uh, restore vision? Next, please. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the visual cortex at the back of the brain. And this idea has been around since at least the 60s. So people have been implanted with arrays of electrodes um, with RF frequency transmitters. And uh, more recently, there are several clinical studies that are ongoing, which um, investigate the nature of the percepts that can be generated when you electrically stimulate the brain. The technology has improved vastly over the years, um, leading to much smaller implants and smaller amounts of current needing to be delivered to the tissue. Next, please. 
So how would such a system work? The blind person would wear a camera on a pair of glasses. The camera sends a video feed to a pocket processor, which then converts the video images into signals. Next, please. And these signals are sent to an implant in the brain. Next, please. And the implant stimulates the visual cortex. Next, please. Which leads to the perception of visual um, images. And how exactly do you stimulate brain tissue in order to generate artificially driven images? Next, please. The most important thing that you have to know is that there's a map of the visual world in our brain. And this map is flipped top to bottom and left to right. So we have an area of about 50 square centimeters at the back of our head. Next, please. And this area is devoted to processing information coming in from the eyes. So every single cell in this region of millions of cells takes in information and is responsible for processing information in a very particular part of the visual field. Next, please. So if I'm looking at a house and a bunch of trees, if I have an electrode inserted inside my visual cortex, next, please then the cells I'm recording from are going to be responsible for processing information coming from a very specific part of the visual field. Next, please. In fact, for example, the cell I'm recording from might be only involved in processing information coming from a few pixels, such as the top of the roof of the house. Next, please. If you imagine that every single neuron processes information from a tiny pixel, in your visual image, then if you combine the information from all the pixels, that's how we're able to get high resolution vision. Next, please. And so when it comes to stimulating the brain, we exploit the properties of this map in our brain. Next, please. Uh, next. So if we insert an electrode into the visual cortex, next, and we stimulate it with current, the current will be injected into the cell. Next, please. And the amazing thing is that the person will see a dot of light, which is known as a phosphine. And so the thing is that I always refer to this as hijacking the brain. Next, please. Because the thing is that neuron is responsible for processing information from a very small pixel in your visual field. And when you zap it electrically, what you're doing is you're forcing that neuron to become active. And that's why that person sees something in that very specific part of your visual field. Next, please. Uh, and next. So if I insert electrode and electrode into the back of the brain, next and I stimulate, for example, the posterior most part of the brain, next, then I will see a phosphine located in the center of vision. Whereas if I advance my electrode and I stimulate it in a more anterior part of the brain, next, um, next two, please, then I will get a phosphine appearing closer to the periphery of vision. If I stimulate the brain on many electrodes, then I'll expect to get phosphines across uh, the whole of visual space, whereas if I stimulate on just a narrow subset of electrodes, then I could potentially, next, um, get simple shapes such as a line. Next. And so we carried out extensive work to develop this uh, in animals and be able to generate actual recognizable shapes. This has never been done before. Next. We used an implant known as the Uta array. So this consists of tiny needles, which are inserted about a millimeter into the cortical tissue. And as you can see here, these are very small arrays, each consisting of a number of electrodes. And we had a large number of arrays implanted in the cortex of a single animal, allowing us to interface with the brain on over a thousand electrodes at the same time. And the great thing is that we're able to both report signals from the brain and stimulate the brain. So how exactly can we get information about what monkeys are seeing? We trained our animals extensively on tasks in the setup. So they were seated in um, the dark. These are sighted animals because stimulation works even if you are sighted. 
and they um, looked at a computer screen and they were trained to carry out behavioral tasks, we monitored the eye movements using an eye tracker and the monkeys would make eye movements to targets to indicate what they saw when we stimulated their brain. Next, please. And so we wanted to find out how good is our implant and can we actually generate phosphine percepts that can be recognized for the first time. Next, please. So first of all, we wanted to see how good the quality of our signals was. So we recorded neuronal activity from the brain. We didn't do any stimulation yet. You're going to see the monkey in its setup, carrying out a task in which um, I swept a bar across the screen. And you'll see that the neuronal response to that moving bar is a corresponding wave of activity that sweeps across the visual cortex which I've color coded here in yellow. So as the bar sweeps across the screen, you see that sweep of um, the neurons being um, activated across the cortex. And in fact, if you look closely, the bar sweeps in each of four different directions and the sweep of activity across the brain also occurs in four different directions. Next, please. Okay, so next, we saw that um, we were able to get good signals with our electrodes, so we did stimulation, and we wanted to firstly find out whether the monkeys were able to see artificially generated phosphine. So they were trained to carry out a task, a visual version at first, in which they fixated at a dot. So they just fix the gaze on the dot at the center of the screen. I presented another dot somewhere on the screen and they would have to make an eye movement to the second dot to report that they saw it and also to show us um, their location. Uh, next, please. So we basically trained the monkeys extensively on the behavioral task and when they became good at it, instead of showing them a real dot on the screen, we just showed, we just stimulated your brain on a single electrode. So what you're seeing here is the monkey fixating on the red dot. We would stimulate the brain and produce a phosphine. And we expected the location of the phosphine to be the same as where the white dot is. So the monkey wasn't actually shown a white dot on the screen it just perceived a phosphine and made an eye movement to it. And you can see that every time we stimulated the brain, that's when the white dot um, appears, which I'm showing just for you, not for the monkey. It makes an eye movement to the dot very consistently. Next, please. So this shows us that monkeys are able to recognize phosphines when we stimulate the visual cortex. The next thing we did was to see if they could recognize movement using electrical stimulation. So again, we trained the monkeys on the visual version of the task before doing a stimulation version, where we showed three dots moving either from bottom to top or top to bottom on the screen. And we presented them with two targets and they would have to make an eye movement to the top target if the direction of motion had been upwards and to the bottom target if the direction of motion had been downwards. So once they became very proficient at this visual version of the task, we substituted the presentation of real dots on the screen with electrical stimulation on three consecutive electrodes in the brain. Next, please. Here you can see the animal doing its task in real time. And the white dots, again, are not really shown on the screen, but just to show you where we think the phosphines would occur. So you can see, for example, if the dots are moving downwards, the monkey is supposed to make an eye movement to the downward target. And if the dots are moving upwards, it should make an eye movement to the upward target. And the monkeys were extremely good at um, doing this task. Um, and clearly they were able to see direction of motion using phosphine. Next, please. So the most complex task we did with them was to teach them to recognize letters made up of dots. For example, a T or an L. And they would have to make an eye movement to the matching letter target. 
once they became proficient at the visual version of recognizing dot letters, we simply delivered stimulation on multiple electrodes at the same time to create what we hoped would be the perception of letters. Next, please. So here, as you can see, the monkey is receiving stimulation, and we think that we're um, generating either an L or an A. So that was a letter A, makes the eye movement to the top target, and letter L, and makes an eye movement to the bottom target. So the monkeys performed this task across um, many sets of letters, and they were able to recognize letters significantly above chance, showing for the first time that it is possible to generate the perception of simple shape using electrical stimulation of the visual cortex. Next, please. So we wanted to translate that work into a clinical study, next please, in which we um, asked whether our results in monkeys would be translatable into blind human patients. And we implanted an array consisting of 96 electrodes in the visual cortex um, in a blind volunteer. Next please. So here you can see the location of the array in the visual cortex. And based on the location of the electrodes in that map um, of visual space in the back of the brain, we predicted the locations at which the phosphines should occur. Next, please. Uh, next. And so the patient reported whether she saw phosphines and where they were in visual space. Next. And amazingly, the reported locations of the phosphines indeed matched those based on the predictions. Next, please. And when um, my colleagues stimulated on multiple electrodes at the same time, for example, if they stimulated on a group of four electrodes, the patient reported, the patient reported seeing a group of phosphines. And um, when stimulation was carried out on a line of electrodes, the patient reported seeing a line. And so um, by and large, the percepts that the person reported seeing matched those that we would predict based on that um, map in the visual cortex. Next, please. Okay, and I want to very briefly touch on some of the developments that we've um, been carrying out in order to make a system that would be more readily usable in a clinical study. Next, please. So ideally, um, one would plant, one would implant um, uh, the device, next please, and then um, turn on the system, next, and the person would just be able to see, next. However, that step of turning on the device is extremely lengthy. Um, next two, please, because right now, a lot of the calibration process is done manually, next. And if you can imagine that this is done on thousands of electrodes, this becomes a very laborious and um, time-consuming process. Next. So right now, how um, it's done in the clinic is that the patient touches a tactile sense, um, a stimulus at the center of a touch screen. Next. And we deliver stimulation. And the person has to report where and whether they saw a phosphine. Next. Uh, so you can imagine if they do it for a few um, electrodes, this is quite a manageable task. Next. Um, but if you start doing it for more, um, this becomes a really, really laborious task. So you can imagine how laborious it is to, to do this process uh, for hundreds of electrodes. So we're developing new techniques to carry out automatic calibration of the system, which we think will make calibration much faster um, and also very affordable in the future. Next. So in summary, we developed a high channel count prosthesis to stimulate and record from the visual cortex. Next. Um, the locations of the phosphines closely matched those based on our predictions and the, ana the anatomy of the brain. Next. Um, we are able to produce recognizable percepts, including motion direction and dot patterns, such as letters. We found that stimulation parameters that we found to be successful in monkeys also worked in blind human volunteers. And finally, next please. 
we're developing new techniques to um, allow the uh, the use of a clinical device that should be much faster and laborious um, in a clinical setting. So thank you very much. Um, uh, and Marlene and I will be very pleased to take any questions. My goodness, thank you very much, both of you. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Sahel, thank you for um, your technical support in the background. Um, so uh, this is a lot of information for our, our audience. And I, I want to uh, say that it's exciting because not only did we see where you started with um, in both of these um, amazing, amazing work that you're doing, the amazing experiments that you're doing in the animals, we also have seen that you both have done work that is now translating into human trials. And um, so I know there's a lot of questions we want to get to, but I'll start off as, and just ask, is this indeed a, a direction that we plan on going on soon here at the University of Pittsburgh to where we would be uh, implementing a device that would help people see directly into the brain uh, in, in a clinical trial here in Pittsburgh? This is, so I will say that um, for me, one of the most exciting um, opportunities about uh, coming to the Department of Ophthalmology is the plan to eventually move to do these kinds of um, trials and interventions in humans. It is a, I think the road is long. Um, and in some ways, I think Dr. Chen and I have are coming to this challenge uh, from um, complementary perspectives. So the way that I think about it is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out like, how does the human visual system work so that ultimately we'll be able to utilize some of these methodologies in the human brain for complex perception, because that's what humans do all the time. Uh, Dr. Chen is coming at it from, you know, really rigorous, systematic, careful studies in non-human primates, and then scaling up to see whether or not the bridge can be built to humans. And so I think the two of us are coming at this together um, from different perspectives, but the, the idea here very much is to begin to think about this work. I'll pass it to Dr. Sahel uh, for further comment if he has. Yeah, thank you very much, Marlene. Yeah, so the, the goal is, the ultimate goal is to uh, provide uh, durable and uh, usable visual perception in people that lost uh, totally their vision and are currently considered as uh, untreatable and there is no, no approach that is currently helping them. So what you have seen from uh, both presentations is that you need to understand very well how the processing of visual information is occurring at the brain level because it's uh, far from being an automatic thing like you're projecting an image like on a screen and this is what is vision vision is a very complex uh, parallel processing at, with many steps and we need to understand that very well at the same time there is both a need for technological development and dr chen showed you the, the need for the right type of electrodes the right type of locations there is need for training uh, as they, they could do in primates and now in uh, a few humans but we want something that won't be just an experiment for a few weeks and showing that it can be working. We want something that will be really helping people in their daily activities. So the way the department is approaching that is really assembling a team that is spanning the full spectrum with people that have this expertise already, like Dr. Chen, and bringing that from experimentation in animals to humans. And uh, we are very careful with the use of animals to really make sure that everything we do is very important done in a very humanistic way, that there is no exposure of animals to something which would be difficult, painful, and that every experiment is really meaningful and indispensable. And this is what is being done. Uh, at the same time, we have assembled a team with people that are experts in uh, visual attention because we see what we want to see. So working on visual attention is a very important element of what we do in the department. And this is why both Dr. Mayo and Dr. Herman are bringing to the department in terms of expertise. We are also collaborating with engineers and the School of Engineering and the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, there is a very good neurosurgeon that is actually already collaborating with Dr. Berman, who is involved in preparing the next experiment that would be conducted uh, in humans at some point. We are also working with uh, uh, two neuroscientists that are partially joining the department, they are belonging to the School of Engineering and putting together 
a proposal for a study that would be very careful desi carefully designed to bring into humans some level of vision restoration. We started the dialogue with the FDA, we got very uh, positive and constructive feedback, working on refining the exact plan before we get into a clinical trial. We are still aiming to start in the coming two years. And as we know, it's not going to be like Dr. Berman was saying, it's not going to be just once, it's going to be a continuous process with a lot of learning. What we want is also to implement all the visual rehabilitation that is needed. We have an amazing team of vision rehabilitation in the department. You heard already webinars by them, both occupational therapists and low vision specialists like Dr. Smith. We also have a platform where we can monitor the impact of low vision, blindness, and vision restoration in daily activities with the street lab. So we put together a continuum with uh, at least 10 different types of scientists and clinicians working together to bring something useful to patients. But we don't want to promise something that would be like a magical restoration of vision, because we know and we learned that already from the work we have done in the retina, that this is both extremely promising, but also you have a lot of learning from each part of the studies, and you are learning with in order to do better the next time and to benefit patients. What is of uh, utmost importance is the safety of our patient in this study, so we want to make sure that for the animals that are a subject to the experiment, and even far more importantly, our patients are fully respected and fully treated in a way that is going to be useful for them and very safe. But as you could see, it's a very systematic, I think you could realize from the, uh, the details, and I think it was important to go through the details, because every single detail is so important. The work that has been done by done by Dr. Berman and, and Dr. Chen. I mean, she was going through every single step. And this is just a summary of her, I think her PhD lasted seven years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, actually, and uh, this is her postdoc work, seven works <laughs> over years of work to get yeah. there. And, uh, and, and we know this is just, that's why it's good that she's young. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's going to take many more years before we see that uh, working <laughs> very well. But it's very promising. If you think about what was happening 10 years ago, five years ago, there was nothing like that. Well, it, it's, it, I agree, Dr. Sell, it's amazing work. And um, I guess uh, in getting to some of our questions on the board, um, uh, and as we're not, none of us are getting any younger, I guess, is there a timeline? When do we... Um, Think that there potentially could be, you know, a clinical trial for the work that we're talking about here. So we talk about two years from now, uh, maybe less, but this will be the first part of the trial because then there is all the refinement, the computer, the computer processing outside the brain, which can be continuously improved, and the training of the patient. Like maybe Xing, uh, you may want to to tell what are the timelines in your mind. Uh, yeah, I think that is possible, and definitely there's an ongoing trial. I see that Sharon asked about the ICVP, uh, ICVP project in Chicago, where they mm -hmm. implanted four electrodes in their first blind volunteer last February and are getting results there. So this is a collective effort um, across, I think, many institutions where we are all trying to see what is possible and push the technology forward. Um, there's still a lot of questions that remain to be answered. Um, another question here. How do you diagnose cortical vision difficulty in a child who is not learning well, functioning in school settings? And what symptoms of learning difficulty are you used to diagnose before proceeding with MRI diagnostic efforts? Is this, is this in our ballpark of a question? Yeah, I think Dr. Berman is collaborating actually with the Children's Hospital on some of these aspects. As you know, we have a very important program with the School of the Blind called Cortical Vision uh, uh, with, uh, with Vision Impairment because this is a very complex uh, condition occurring in children and there is an ongoing program with Dr. Nishal and uh, Dr. Berman is associated with that, and we collaborate with the School for the Blind. This is a poorly understood condition. Actually, it's probably several conditions, and we are working in a very systematic manner. We are not the only ones trying to understand exactly what it is, because it might be actually a spectrum of conditions, and each of them could have a different type of management. I don't know, Marlene, if you want to say anything else on that. No, I mostly agree. I think uh, the, there are a host of underlying um, causes for CVI. Uh, cortical visual impairment. Um, it can result from all kinds of possibilities, infections, head injuries, even, you know, more minor things like um, a, a small time when there was not um, oxygen available during birth, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long string of underlying causes. It's a confusing condition, 
Um, and it's probably because the, there are multiple conditions. It isn't just one single condition. Um, my strongest recommendation uh, for anyone who wishes to pursue um, a diagnosis of uh, CBI or uh, to understand further is to be in touch with uh, Dr. Nichol at uh, Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, we, we've learned that there are many, many um, uh, young people who unfortunately and, and, and older people as well who suffer with that. So um, we are at the end of the hour, which is yeah. we stick to that very clo closely. There's a few questions that we um, our team will get to and work with um, our our uh, scientists and clinicians today to get to you. But I'm very excited that you got to hear this today because I do think it's an amazing work. And just thinking about it just does does give you chills to think that there's potential to be able to see without the use of our eyes to be able to directly uh, transmit a signal to the brain to be able to help us see. And obviously, as we're doing other things at the University of Pittsburgh, we all know there's been technology has allowed people to um, with with similar technology to be able to move a robotic arm. I think. Um, you know, we, we are all uh, certainly very optimistic that the same can be done in, in this area. So uh, uh, please send us your emails with any questions and we would be happy to answer them. And uh, thank you so much for attending today. Um, you'll get a, an email with a, a recording of this and it will go out to everybody at Registered. We'll also have it available on our website. And uh, we're so proud to be able to, to uh, bring this to you today. So thank you very much.